Hi everyone, in this episode our goal is going to be to get an object moving around to the player's input and have another object chase after it. First however, let's look at one important detail. So a speed is a measure of how far something travels in a single second. So if we say something has a speed of 12, that means it moves 12 meters per second. Velocity is a vector which describes how far and in what direction something travels in a second. So if we take a speed like 12 meters per second and multiply it by a direction like negative 0.8x, 0.6y, we get a velocity vector of negative 9.6 meters on the x-axis by 7.2 meters on the y-axis per second. Each frame, we want to use this velocity to determine how many meters to move the object. So we multiply the velocity by delta time, the number of seconds that have passed since the last frame was drawn. This number tends to fluctuate, but if the game is running at 60 frames a second, then delta time will be around 0.017 seconds. By doing this multiplication, we have successfully eliminated the seconds unit, leaving only the number of meters to be moved this frame. Okay, let's open up a new project in Unity, and I'd quickly like to take a look at the input manager, so let's head over to Edit Project Settings Input. You can see we've got a whole bunch of input axes uh, defined by default. So let's take a closer look at the horizontal axis. You can see it's got the name horizontal, which we can edit if we want. And then it's also got a negative button left and a positive button right. So the reason for the names negative and positive is that in the input class, there's a method called getAxis. And if we pass in the name of the axis, for example, horizontal, then the method will return zero. If neither of these buttons are held down, it will return negative one, if the negative button is held down, and positive one if the positive button is held down. And then we've also got this alternative negative and positive buttons set to A and D. And if we look at the vertical axis, you can see these are set to down, up, S and W, so we can control our player with the arrow keys or with W, A, S, D. And these are all editable, of course. We could change this to be B to move down if we wanted, but I don't particularly want that, so I'll change it back to S. All right, in the project window, let's just right click to create a new C-sharp script and I'll call this player. Let's now go up here to the game object menu and create a cube object. And we can just attach our player script to that object. So as we discussed in the introduction to the Unity interface, all objects in our scene have got this transform component uh, attached to them, which allows us to modify their position, rotation and scale. Now we can modify these properties from our script. So for example, in the start method of the player class, you could write transform. And note that there's transform with a capital T referring to the transform class in general. And then with a small t, it's referring to the specific transform attached to the same game object as the script. So that's of course the one that we're going to want to use to modify the transform properties of this object. So we can say, for example, transform.position, which as you can see here, is just a vector3. So if we want to set that, we can say equals new vector3, and then we just have to pass in values for the x, y, and z axes. So we could say, uh, let's say 0, 10, 0. And now if we run this, you can see that the object will immediately leap up to 0, 10, 0. Okay, let's go ahead and delete the start method. And inside of the update method, let's worry about getting our input vector. So let's say vector3, and we can call this our input, is equal to a new vector3. So now for our x value, we're going to want to get the horizontal input. So let's say input.getAxis. Now, as you can see, there are two getAxis methods, getAxis and getAxisRaw. So the difference between the two is, say we're not uh, holding down any key, so both of them will be returning zero. Then say we press down the left key, getAxisRaw will immediately start returning negative one, while getAxis will smooth the value from zero to negative one over a couple of frames. I tend to use getAxisRaw because if you want the input to be smoothed, then it's usually preferable to do that yourself so that you have greater control over it. So let's go with that one. Get access raw. We're going to pass in the axis name as a string. So open quotation marks. Let's write in horizontal. Close quotation marks and close the parentheses. 
then comma for the y-axis we're going to just have a value of zero and then we'll get our vertical input for the z-axis so once again just input dot get axis raw this time passing in vertical as our string parameter and then close the parentheses for the vector 3 and semicolon let's quickly just do a printout of the input vector and have a look at that in unity so i'm just going to turn off the collapse option in the console and if we press play now you can see it's printing out 0 0 0 and if i press left the x-axis is negative 1 right it's 1 and up and down is working as well all right so in order to get the direction of the input, we're going to have to normalize that vector as we spoke about in the last video. So let's say vector3 direction is equal to input dot normalized, which returns the normalized vector3. And then at the top of the class here, we can just define a float for our player's speed, set that equal to maybe 10. Then we can say, vector3 velocity is equal to the direction multiplied by the speed. Finally, we can make a vector3 move amount, which is equal, as we discussed, to velocity multiplied by time dot delta time. All right, so now to update our transform's position, we can say transform dot position plus equals the move amount. Let's save that and give this a try. So if we press play, we can now move this object around. Very nice. An alternative way to do this, which is perhaps a little more common, is to use the transform.translate method. As you can see, this takes in a vector 3 for the translation, in other words, the move amount. So if we save that and just play again, the behavior will be identical. All right, so next we're going to want to introduce a new object to chase the player around. So let's create a new c -sharp script and can just maybe call this chaser. And then I'm going to create a little sphere object. I'll just move this off to the side here and apply the chaser script to that. So inside of this chaser class, we're going to need a reference to the player object's transform so that we can keep track of its position. So let's, at the top of the class, create a public transform variable, this time transform with a capital T referring to the type, and we can call this our target transform. Now, one of the nice features of Unity is that if we make a variable public inside of a class that inherits from monobehavior, then if we just save this quickly, that variable will show up and be editable inside of the inspector. So if we want to assign the player's transform to this variable, we just drag the cube into that field. There are ways of getting the target transform entirely from within the code, searching for the object using its name or a tag or something like that. But this is the easiest and probably most common way of getting a reference to another object. So let's delete the start method since we won't be needing that. And we want to start off by calculating the direction between our own object and the target transform. So we briefly looked at how to do this last episode. We need to take the position of the target and subtract our own position from that to get the displacement. And then we normalize that vector to get the direction towards the target. So let's create a vector three. And let's just call this the displacement from target. So this will be equal to target transform dot position and from that we'll subtract our own transform dot position. All right, we can then calculate vector three direction to target is equal to the displacement from target dot normalized. Let's create a speed variable in here as well. So float speed, maybe make it a little bit slower than the player, say seven. And then we can say vector three velocity is equal to the 
direction to target multiplied by the speed. Finally, we can use the transform.translate method, passing in velocity multiplied by time.delta time to give us our move amount. Let's save and try this out. So we'll just press play. And we should see the sphere now chases after us. Of course, when it reaches us, then it does this sort of wobbling thing as it overshoots its target and then corrects and overshoots again and so on. Um, it might be quite nice to sort of define a stopping distance so that maybe it, it stops before it quite reaches the player. So let's say float distance to target is equal to the displacement from target dot magnitude. We can then say if the distance to the target is, say, greater than 1.5, only then will we actually move this object towards the target. Let's try that out now. As you can see, it stops about 1.5 units away from the player. It might be quite nice to make the speed variable public as well. And we can perhaps do that for the player class too. And this will just give us easy access to these variables, so even inside of play mode, we can experiment with different values. And this is obviously a great tool for experimenting with different values and just seeing what works best. Uh, it's worth noting that any variable that you change uh, during game mode will revert back to its value before you entered game mode. Another thing to note is that we've set this to seven now in the inspector. So even if I come to the script and now give it a starting value of zero, the inspector value takes precedence over the script value. So you can see even though it's zero in the script, it's actually taking the value of seven from the inspector. As a sort of finishing touch to make our scene a little prettier, let's perhaps right click and create a new material. You can call this the player material. And we can drag that onto the cube and we can just give it a different color and I'll maybe make that a slightly stronger red. And then let's duplicate that with Command D and call this the chaser material. I'll apply that to the chaser and maybe give this a green color. And then let's also just create a plane and uh, I'll move the cube and sphere to uh, be sort of sitting on the plane make this a little bit bigger maybe, just scale it out. If you don't remember, the scale tool is up here, or you can switch to it with the R key. And alternatively, of course, we can just edit the values manually in the inspector. All right, let me just duplicate this once more, create a ground material, apply that to the ground, and can make this a nice dark gray. All right, so our scene looks much prettier now. Let's just try this out one final time. Loads of fun could play this for hours. In all seriousness though, we've achieved what we set out to do and the result is pretty nice. So I hope you've enjoyed and see you next episode. Cheers.